Order, order. Uh, can I welcome our witnesses? We will now hear evidence from Shelter, the Citizens Advice Bureau, the Law Centres Federation, the Advice Services Alliance and R3. For the record, please could I ask each of our witnesses in turn, from left to right, to introduce yourselves by name and organisation to the committee. And once you've all done that, if any of you would like to make a brief introductory statement, you're most welcome to do so. And we'll start off with Frances Coulson. Thank you. Um, Frances Coulson, I'm President of R3, which is the insolvency trade body. We have 97% of insolvency practitioners as our members, and I'm a, a lawyer. Um, my name is Anne Lewis. I'm Policy Director at the, at the Advice Services Alliance. We're the umbrella body for the um, advice networks, and some of our members, but not all of them, are represented in this room. Uh, my name is Julie Bishop. I'm the director of the Law Centres Federation, and there are around 56 law centres located around the country, staffed mostly by lawyers. I'm Julian, Julian Guy, Chief Executive of Citizens Advice, which is the central body for Citizens Advice, representing that and almost 400 separate bureaus who are particularly affected by the legal aid proposals. I'm Simon Pugh. I'm Head of Legal Services at Shelter. We're a national social welfare law provider specialising particularly in housing, debt and welfare benefits. Could I thank you all for those introductions and encourage you to speak up crisply and clearly because not only are you addressing the committee but you're also in many ways addressing the nation and we want to hear what you have to say. Okay, we're now going to go into the evidence session. I'm going to start off with Mr Fluid and then Mr Watts then Alex Cunningham, Yvonne Favarg, Liz Truss, Kate Green, Robert Buckland and Andy Slaughter. Elton. Good afternoon. Uh, the government intends to make legal aid available in cases involving domestic violence, but you will know there's been some discussion about the actual definition of domestic violence within this bill. The government has now widened it somewhat. Do you believe that the new definition is adequate and sufficient? One thing that we would say is that law centres, uh, its specialty is within the area of uh, social welfare law. However, our involvement with domestic violence is often as a trigger to social welfare law problems. In relation to your question, though, our view is that according to the impact statement, there are only an additional thousand people who will be assisted with the widened definition. So we believe that means that it's only been tweaked with as opposed to widened. And we would support the submission put by the Women's Institute and the definition that they're putting forward for domestic violence. Can I just add Julian Guy. Um, I think that the definition itself, it's helpful to broaden it, but the, the main issue is identifying where this where this occurs. And our experience in citizens' advice is that it's very often a secondary issue. If we're not giving advice on the primary issue around debts that come about, around housing issues, we're unlikely to pick that up and therefore get the representation that people need. Okay. Dave Watts. The Prime Minister is on record as saying he thinks that the uh, Citizens' Advice Bureau is a wonderful organisation and he wants to do all he can to support them. What would he need to do, and what resources would he have to provide for you to be able to cope with the, the potential changes and demands that's coming on the service? First of all, I, I would have to agree with the Prime Minister in his assessment, um, but I, I'd just say that the, the two sets of issues that really bother us about these reforms, uh, one of them is taking out of scope uh, debt, housing and benefit advice. Uh, which will leave an advice gap, we believe. And the thing that would need to be done by the government to make up that gap is to make proper alternative provision if indeed it's to come out of legal aid scope. So that's the first argument. The second argument is then if it does come out, it can't just land nowhere. Where will those people go? I suspect they'll go to MP surgeries, but they've got to have somewhere to go to get, get that advice. Uh, we've got to be able to uh, re realise the return on investment of early intervention and early advice, which will have gone, 
uh, if we don't have that alternative provision. And we've got to make sure that vulnerable people are not unassisted going through proceedings or, or, or being able to get themselves out of the chain of events that takes them into proceedings. So the first set of issues is around there has to be an alternative if this is to go forward. The second set of issues are that the legal aid that in, in scope that remains under the proposals is particularly complex in terms of elig eligibility and hard to apply. So there, there need, will need to be some more uh, clarity and simplicity around that. Um, there would also, uh, we believe, need to be something to bring these two things together. There is a, a, an intention, I think, under the proposals to segregate what is seen as general advice and what is seen as pure legal advice. Well, people don't present as purely one or the other. They present with a number of issues, many of them intertwined. And we need to make sure that there is a way of not having a segregation of that advice because life isn't like that and people aren't like that. So we have to look at the whole system and I believe that's something else that has to be done to make these proposals work. What size of resources, would you, what size, what size of increase in resources would you require to do the, the functions that you've just set out? Well, have you got any estimates about what your members' associations would need to be able to do that? Well, I know what we Linda. currently get to do that. We, we currently get 25 million to do that. Um, that's a stretch as it is, as all these resources are. And I also would like to point out to the committee that this is not um, in isolation. I mean, we've, we're facing local government cuts to the Bureau in the localities where they give the advice. We're facing financial inclusion money cuts that were given a reprieve, but we still have to face that issue. And here's another one, another 25 million being taken out of that advice system. So we would need at least as much as we get currently, but we believe that the demand isn't standing still. We've got welfare reform coming along, which I think will bring uh, an increase in demand. And we do have a recession that I think we've all noticed um, that is in increasing debt, increasing housing problems, and really burgeoning that, that demand. Thank you. Ms. Truss. Isn't it the case that, in, when we're talking about quite a few of these issues, that it, they're not strictly legal matters? And at the moment, the way Britain deals with them is to treat them as legal matters. That's why we've got such a high legal aid bill, relatively speaking, compared to other countries. And if you look at the scope of legal aid in other countries, it is narrower, and there's a lower income threshold uh, for those other countries. On issues like the, the welfare system, isn't it the case that it, we should be improving those services at source? So, for example, there are fewer errors made in the first place in the benefits system that don't require the, that legal redress afterwards. I mean, would, would you agree with the general principle that it's wrong to spend all this money on legal services when actually that isn't the reason the problems have been caused in the first place? Um, Lewis. I mean, I think that we would all agree that if the benefit system could be made more straightforward and less legalistic, that would be a good thing. However, the situation is at the moment that it is legalistic and it is very complex. And I've got quotes which I won't read out to you from judges using words like labyrinthine and mm. bewildering. Um, when they're talking about the benefit system. And before I came this morning, I checked out the handbook that's used by many welfare benefit advisors, the Child Poverty Action Group handbook. This handbook it has got 1,600 pages, and it refers to 45 Acts of Parliament and 185 regulations. The, bit, the, system, the system at the moment is complex, and some people within the system do need specialist welfare benefit advice, and that is our view. But it does that this advice price. necessarily have to be legal? Yeah, I, I think at the moment this, the system is so complex that some, some people, not all people, mm. and not all problems, but in some situations people do need specialist welfare benefit advice, and that is legal advice. These are, this is a legal Analyst. structure. Uh, could Anybody I respond sure? to that? Um, there are two things to answer. Number one is that in order to resolve the whole client's problem, that we do need to provide a number of services to them. Some are legal, some are non-legal. However, uh, uh, our agencies work together in a streamlined and coordinated fashion. And I put an example of one 
in our evidence, where in fact we have referral routes. So in the case of law centres, the problem doesn't come to us until it is a legal problem. And so we use legal skills, we use legal aid to resolve legal problems. We don't provide generalist advice in order to provide a legal problem. But the second point I wanted to answer was your question about the scope and that the scope is narrower in other countries. Well, as you can hear, I can speak about the Australian jurisdiction. Um, the equivalent of social welfare law there is actually handled differently, you're correct, but it does come out of what's called the Attorney General's Department. $60 million Australian is given to the equivalent of law centres who have a very wide jurisdiction. Uh, there are 200 of those. They serve a couple of hundred thousand people per year. They're not means tested. The funding's flexible, but they are also funded to do public legal education and as well as that to, re to have a look at systemic issues and provide solutions to government for the knowledge and learning that comes from that. Mm. So when you talk about legal aid, mm. it is, there are different formats of it and I think a number of your, of, of your pieces of information doesn't include Aboriginal legal aid, it doesn't include the Community Legal Advice mm. Service nor does it include something called the Family Violence Centres, which are centres that really are addressed, and again, it's out of the legal aid pocket to deal with issues of family violence. Mm. I mean, do you, Ms. Cross. Would, I mean, I'd be very interested to hear more about this. Would you have an assessment of the overall cost of providing that advice in that way, as opposed to the way it's provided here in the UK? I think... Um, I'm not an economist, but I think another really key difference is that legal aid in Australia is by and large a salaried service. Um, and so that means that there are grants of legal aid, but private lawyers uh, are so poorly funded with their grants of legal aid in Australia that they regard it as pro bono, more or less. So it's true to say that the hourly rate is much lower However, the bulk of legal aid is actually delivered through a salaried service. So the format, the way legal aid is delivered is actually quite different and that can help to explain some of the differences. And uh, I will, I can get you some more yeah, information and I you. will. That's extremely, extremely helpful. Um, so in terms of the proposals that the government has put forward in the bill for the reform, of legal aid, what would, do you think the bill is too high at the moment, a general question for the panel, and do you see alternatives for how that legal aid bill could be reduced? Or are you saying that it's essentially being generated by other parts of government, like the excessively bureaucratic welfare system? Julian Guy. I think, uh, just to answer two questions in one here, uh, it would be great if none of us were needed anymore. I think that, mm. that would be where we'd probably aim for. But I think things are going to get worse before they get better. And when we talk about <coughs> welfare reform, for example, solving those issues, we've got to go through transition and dual running first. And I think there's going to be a lot of confusion that we're going to have to pick up. The danger I see in being legalistic about what's legal and what's not legal is that it's actually very difficult to make that kind of definition and draw that line. And that's why we're arguing that we need a whole system approach to advice and also need to be mindful of the fact that early intervention advice saves things from becoming technically legal and costing the system an awful lot more once they get to that point. So if we're able to resolve issues at an early stage, we save the court system, the tribunal system, all of those <coughs> a, a lot more cost further down the line. In terms of international comparison as well, uh, just being aware that it's difficult to compare jurisdictions, it's difficult to compare benefit systems and those kind of things, that is, that is all very complicated. But there are certainly, I think, assumptions here that the only cost driver for legal aid is actually the scope, and there are many other cost drivers that ought to be looked at uh, before that, potentially. One of them is how things are screened, and there is early advice and that, that prevention that goes on. One of them is about an entirely bureaucratic system that we've all suffered at the hands of for, for some time, which does waste money and takes it away from front line. 
Uh, one of those as well is about the, the balance. And there are, if we look at the legal aid expenditure, just a few in relative terms, very, very expensive cases that are funded through that system, whereas investment early on in many, many more cases actually does bear considerably more fruit uh, in terms of cost coming out of the mm -hmm. system. Simon Pugh. I would just add to that that um, <coughs> the overall spending on social welfare law, which is what we're talking about here, is a small part of the, of the legal aid budget. It's only about 5 or 6 per cent. And I would echo the importance of giving early advice at an early stage of the problem to resolve the problem and to stop it getting worse and to stop it getting to the point where you need very expensive court proceedings. But that early advice, important though it is, is still legal. It's still on a matter of law. It's still on a question of law. Mm -hmm. But it's a way of avoiding having to go to court proceedings or tribunal proceedings. So if we can intervene at an early stage, then we can stop cases spiralling to the point where they cost more later on. I mean, you just this what, one more point. I mean, on the, on the subject of tribunals, isn't it case, the case that the legal aid system has partly drive, driven the legalisation of some of these bodies? So tribunals were initially meant not to be a body where lawyers would represent people, but that has ended up happening. And it's partly because we're pushing more money through legal aid rather than other ways of solving those problems. I would, argue that, I would argue that that is um, largely um, because of the complexity of the, of, the, of the work that we're dealing with. I mean, Anne has pointed out how complex the welfare benefit system is, and that law is, is very complex and very difficult, and that is why yeah, people need important. the help of lawyers to navigate that. So you could reduce costs by simplifying the system and making it easier for people and for preventing mistakes from being dealt with in the first place, and that way you reduce demand rather than just simply cutting out the supply. And and if I can just add, um, the situation is that most, um, in most tribunals, legal aid is not available to fund representation in any event. The um, only one yes. is, is mental health and yeah. immigration. So I think that argument can't apply in the larger tribunals like employment and welfare benefits, social security, whatever it's called. Kate Green argument about reducing the costs uh, by simplifying the system and Gillian Guy you mentioned uh, that we were obviously anticipating some very substantial welfare reforms uh, and that at least for a time uh, there would be transition problems and parallel running of systems which would create a greater need for advice. In the long run what's your expectation that the system will become sufficiently simpler uh, as a result of universal credit and other reforms? to the extent that the proposals that the government is bringing forward could be made workable. Uh, I think the answer needs to be we're optimists by nature. Um, so obviously the, the whole aim of this system is to simplify it um, and try and, and, and not have to duplicate data, information and make sure that people understand what benefit they're entitled to. Um, we are also realists about, as, as you say, that transitional um, part, which is going to be ex extremely complicated. And I think the other point to make is that, that there is an intention to simplify. The devil, as ever, will be in the detail. And we're trying to be constructive with government in working through that detail. But ultimately, the question will be, is this achievable? And is it going to be as simple and as, as clear as it is setting out to be? And from the point of view of more vulnerable clients, people perhaps with learning difficulties, mental health difficulties and so on, do you anticipate the system becoming simple enough to, for them to navigate without assistance? I suspect they will always need assistance and that's why as Citizens Advice we are protecting our face-to-face -face as well uh, because another feature of these proposals of course is around telephone access which immediately excludes a large number of people who do require to just empty a carrier bag of things in front of someone, sort through them and, and get some advice. Robert Buckley. Um, it's primarily a question for Gillian Guy. Um, I've read the submissions from the CAB, LA15, uh, Mr Hollowbone, with, with care, and I was particularly interested at the, in the last paragraph and the proposals to, in effect, allow uh, for the creation of local legal advice partnerships. Um, am, am I right in, in understanding really that would be a, a shift in commissioning so that the partnership or the CAB would be the Commissioner of Legal Services locally? Yes, this, this, was a Sorry, this was a proposal put forward by Citizens Advice to try and deal with the issues that I outlined, outlined earlier. 
which are about needing a whole system and not having a, an artificial separation between what is seen as general and what is seen as legal, because the, the complication and the continuum goes through an, in, an, an entire uh, system. So it was an attempt to say that actually if we drew out the advice from what is proposed uh, under, the, um, under the bill, um, and, and put a whole system together, we could actually take it into local commissioning so that it dealt with local advice need from beginning to end. Now, I know that that is not particularly uh, meeting the government's policy objectives, and that's because the government wants to be very clear about what's in legal aid, and I understand that from a perspective of not having the growth and the creep that has gone on uh, in past years. Yeah. So uh, I understand that proposal is not necessarily uh, attractive, but we think that that could work to resolve some of the issues that we've spoken about. The alternative is to make sure that at least we have some more provision around the advice end, which is a, currently a gap under the legislation, and we have to work together to think how that interface is going to, is going to uh, be affected. Otherwise, we will have the separation. Uh, uh, thank you for the detail. Well, Just well, well, thank you, Ms. Oller. On uh, following up, how, how would that work, for example, with um, private practice, lo local private practitioners? Would they be involved in the system, or, or would they be sort of outside, out with this idea of commissioning? How, how would that work? Well, our idea was Do that it would involve ahead. all local advice givers, so that we weren't uh, tripping over each other, that we understood what the local need was, and that we worked together to meet that need in the most cost-effective uh, and uh, efficient way. I think Julie. Julie Bishop. Uh, just to add on to what Gillian's yeah. saying is that the committee may be interested to visit a well-functioning example of this, which is called Advice Services Coventry, which already has uses technology appropriately, has streamlined methods for referral. Um, they do hot referrals where if you walk into one agency and you're not able to deal with it, they can send the notes, etc., via computer. They have protocols to work with the local private advisors, and it's been running for the last five years. That's but one example. But if you were interested, it's quite a good mm. example to mm. have a look at, at mm. how a conception such as Gillian's putting forward mm. does actually and is actually working in practice. Mm. And it also fits in with the government's agenda because it's bottom up it's local, it's addressing local needs, it does needs-based strategic planning, they use legal services research centre needs analysis to do mapping of where they have to target services, etc. Robert Buckland. Just, just to follow that up, I'm very interested by what generally your evidence, uh, Judy Bishop, so thank you very much for, for that. But uh, just. Coming back to, to the, the problem the government has, and I think we all acknowledge the issue for the government is how we control the budget and how, we, how the government manages to keep a purchase on, on its expenditure on proper legal aid. Um, I accept the point that you make that a person coming along for advice doesn't turn up and go, hello, I'm a legal debt problem. They turn up with a, sometimes a multiplicity of issues, and it, it's often the task of the advisor to work out into which category they may fall, and that's currently the position with legal aid as it stands now. But could could a system be developed so that, in effect, there were there were there were two thresholds: one that the general threshold that you come in on, and then a further threshold that would ensure that the government's objectives of controlling the legal aid budget were met. So that, in other words, people who were filtered through were only getting legal advice. That, we were getting proper legal advice that, that was properly funded. Yes. I, that, Julie Bishop. Thank you. That's exactly the protocol that's in place at Coventry, where someone can come in to, if they arrive first of all at the law centre and it's not deemed appropriate, it would be sent off to a more general agency to deal with those other problems. So, for example, with an employment matter, if it's something that ACAS can deal with, the other agency would have assisted them to deal with it that way, but it's only once a person is dismissed or needs something that is of a more legal <coughs> nature that they're actually referred to Coventry Law Centre. But it is our view that this is a very difficult rationing problem that the government has, yes. but as grassroots agencies, mm. this is the nature of our game. That's what we do. We ration services every day. 
And so the Coventry example has been a mechanism to try and effectively ration very limited resources. And so the collaboration is one means of doing it. But what Coventry example gives us is the ability to deal with a person who has a multiplicity of needs. It's not someone who happens to, as you say, hi, I'm debt, you know, and please ignore my, you know, my loss of job. Julian Guy. I just wanted to add another point, if I may. What's, what I think we're trying to describe together is actually getting the, the right people, the best people, with the <coughs> suitable qualifications to deal with the right level of problem. Um, and what we wouldn't be talking about, which we currently endure, is a system whereby we have um, that dictated by funding streams. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we're particularly anxious about segregation of issues is that we can have legal advisors funded through legal aid who sit idle for hours during the day when they could be giving advice on other funding streams, but there is this accountability for, for how that, that is managed. And that's why we don't want to see people parceled up and sent from one place to another, but actually have a collaborative approach that allows us to pool our resources and use them most effectively to resolve the problems. Yvonne Pavard. Chairman. If social welfare law is removed from scope, what do you believe will be the impact on your networks and all the advice services that you provide? Well, I can... Julie Bishop. Thank you. Uh, I can speak for law centres directly. Mm. I think we've supplied in the evidence that around 80% of our legal aid funding will go. We've already lost 53% of local authority funds. That's not foreshadowed, that's lost already. Um, so we estimate that when you add all the bits of funding together, a minimum of 40% of our funding will be removed. So that clearly means we have to reduce and really think very carefully about who we can see and who we can't, what do we focus on and what don't we. But the short of it is law centres alone, at least 80,000 people won't be served. And those 80,000, 79.5% of them are not white. More startling, over 90% of them, in fact 90.5% of them earn less than £6,000 a year. So I'm not sure what will happen. Obviously they'll go to... Um, to in, actually our, our clients won't be at MP surgeries, many of them, because they don't have the wherewithal to get them. Where they'll be is in doctor's surgeries, um, hanging around churches, sitting on streets, begging for money. They'll be adding costs to government elsewhere in the system. That's where our clients will be. Thank you. Just to Simon Pugh. In terms of shelter, I mean, we estimate that if these proposals go through that we'd lose something like 45% um, of our income from legal aid and all of our advice centres across the country do legal aid in combination with other things. So the impact of that on the viability of each individual advice centre is something that we would have to think about very carefully and we wouldn't be expecting our charitable fundraising income to be able to expand sufficiently to fill that gap. Um, we help about 25,000 people a year through legal aid and we would lose many of those cases. Uh, there would be large numbers of people that we would no longer be able to help. Um, but we are also concerned about the impact on the people that we would be able to help. Um, we do housing, we do welfare benefits, we do debt in many places, and as has been said repeatedly, people don't have a housing problem, they don't have a debt problem, they don't have a benefits problem, they have all three. So if we can no longer deal with the whole issue, we're not solving the problem. If we have a client who comes in who is in arrears and at risk of having their, their home repossessed because they've got housing benefit issues at the moment, we can get the possession proceedings adjourned, we can deal with the housing benefit issues, and then when the case comes back to court, the benefit problems are resolved, the arrears are brought down, and the client is allowed to continue in their home. Uh, under these proposals, we wouldn't be able to deal with the underlying issue, we wouldn't be able to resolve the cause, so that we would simply be able to adjourn the case, send the client off to do their own benefits work, it's not going to happen, they come back to court, nothing has changed. So if we can't solve the underlying problem because we can't deal with the whole issue, then that's going to have a significant impact on the people that we are still able to help. Julian Guy. The, the impact on Citizens Advice Bureau will be, as I, as I said earlier, we currently get £25 million through legal aid. 
20 million of that would go under these proposals, so that's an 80% cut in, in that funding. That would mean about 450 advisors uh, would also go from within the citizens' advice system. And clearly that starts to, to hit with the other funding issues that I've already mentioned at the viability of those bureaus. And particularly when taken in the context of this not being spread evenly amongst bureaus, but about only half of them have legal aid contracts, so the percentage of of their um, income that that provides is much higher than were if it were spread across the whole piece. It's also a random impact, and I think that's particularly uh, dangerous given where advice will then be available and where it won't be available, and there will be areas we imagine uh, that, that will be hit higher. And also the smaller contracts that could come out of legal aid will probably not be economically viable and won't be attractive. So we could see advice agencies and indeed small firms of, of advisors and lawyers actually either going out of business or certainly keeping out of legal aid work. And Lewis? Um, I'd just like to put that evidence into the wider context, context of what's going on in the, um, in, with our other members. Um, we have members including Age UK, which is previously a, um, Age Concern, um, Youth Access and Dial, which is a disability um, a network of disability advice organisations. All of those organisations report that their members are losing funding to the tune of between 20 and 40 per cent. So the capacity in the wider sector is also going down and I think we're going to find um, clients or potential clients basically having to go around from place to place trying to find anybody with the capacity to help them. Thank you. Can I, on for that. Thank you. Can I just move on slightly to the debt work and what do you think the effect and the extra costs may be of restricting access to debt advice simply to people who are in an imminent loss of losing their home? Well, Simon Pugh, if we are not able to help people who present to us with arrears problems early on, then we may not be able to negotiate a solution, for example, with the landlord to give them time to repay it. If we can only deal with it when the risk is immediate, it may well be too late to solve the problem by that point. Thank you. I think the answer is... It's, sorry, it's poor value for money. Mm -hmm. What it's doing is, instead of spending less than £200 resolving the issue early on, you're waiting until it has to go to court. It will cost more money. But it's not just poor value for money in terms of pounds. It's poor value for money in terms of stress and heartache of the person who has to get to that stage. And, and I think the other issue is that even if you are able to, re to resolve the issues, the debt issues that result into the threat of the loss of the home, if there are other debt issues, it seems to me that any solution in relation to the potential homelessness risks being a temporary one only because people are likely to come back again unless you've resolved all of the debt problems insofar as it, that's possible. Julian Guy. Just to add that I think it's a feature of having any system that's geared towards a crisis point that actually that will exacerbate and multiply the number of crises that we have to deal with because it won't be possible to give the advice at an earlier stage. And I think the social cost to that as well as the economic cost is enormous. Thank you. Tom Brake, then Alex Cunningham. Could I just ask, Gillian Guy, did, did you say earlier that you had advisors who were sitting idle, paid for by legal aid, who couldn't do other work because they were being paid for on legal aid? I said it was a feature of Gillian any Guy. system that, um, that has an accountability that says that certain people under funding streams can only do certain work that inevitably there will be other work coming in through the door that they cannot pick up. Okay. So it is a possibility that they could on any one day, any one occasion, be left idle while there is work to do. Well, clearly, if, and I think you did say they were sitting idle, clearly if that is happening, then is, are there not ways within the CAB that perhaps you could, you could organise that in such a way that presumably that there is clearly business in other CABs that potentially that person could be doing perhaps? Um, well, Julian Guy. Uh, the explanation was about the um, unforeseen and probably unintended consequences of having strict funding. The reality on the ground is that I would be hard pressed to find anyone who was actually sitting doing nothing. But it is a feature of the, of the system itself. 
And actually, I am sure we find ways around all of that because that's what we do as advice agencies on a daily basis, every one of us, because we are rationing, we are dealing with more demand than we can cope with. But in terms of accountability, we are not supposed to do that. So when we have to tell the LSC what we spend the money on, we cannot spend it or be deemed to have spent it on anything that is not within the remit of that legal aid contract. Can I just ask you and, and indeed the other organisations, when we had evidence uh, from the Bar Council on Tuesday, uh, they were talking about providing more training uh, for barristers in mediation because they, they thought there was still potential to expand in that area. Uh, anticipating perhaps an increase in mediation work, what, what are your organisations doing collectively to, uh, can you increase the, the number of mediators to, to, to take up that, that work? Um, Julie Bishop. Yes. I think that there are two answers to that question. And number one is that one of the main attempts, law, the way law centres try to solve problems is always diversionary and that's what they were set up to do. It was to use legal skills and bring the knowledge and understanding of the law to people's problems so they could be resolved effectively but that doesn't mean going to court. So always it's preference, uh, the choice is to ring and to try and get a negotiated settlement. So that's our practice as it is. Um, they may not be uh, licensed mediators, but their method of working is alternate dispute resolution in the broader sense. That's one answer to the question. But the second is yes, like all other organisations, we are actually looking more extensively at mediation, what sort of training, the problem, there are many issues with mediation, not, which of, uh, not least of which is that there are a whole lot of different qualifications, different styles of mediation, etc. So it's a big area, but the simple answer is absolutely that's what we're looking to. But I do want to stress that our practice is one of diversionary early resolution, anyhow. But you do have an active Humbrick. program of extending mediation or the number of people who are working in that field. Uh, we've Julie got, Bishop. I wouldn't say we've got a funded <coughs> active program of doing it, but we certainly have an active project of investigating and determining where we might get money in order to do that. Because remember with us we have lots of big ideas, but we have very limited resources. So often our resources are running up behind the ideas. And Lewis? Um, I'd just like to say that obviously for the advice sector, very many of the problems that people bring to us concern issues around um, it, services provided by the state, benefits, housing, community care, education and so on. I think one of the difficulties um, in that situation is that mediation often isn't possible because the arms of the state aren't able to engage with mediation either, <coughs> and that is a limiting factor. Julian Guy. As citizen advice, we, we do think that mediation is one of the tools that we have in, in its loosest term, if you like, but uh, like the Law Centres Federation, it's not about having uh, registered mediation, if, if you like. I think it's important to say that, that that's one of the things that drives us to try and stop people getting caught up in the whole of the legal system, which we know is costly, but it's also costly emotionally and tends to ex extend the period of time that a problem would exist. So, so that would be our aim. But I do think it's important not to mislead the committee that suddenly there could be a mediation system that grows up in the voluntary sector and operates on thin air because that won't happen, it can't happen, and although we're extremely good value, we're not free. Simon Pugh. For the reasons that everybody has given, many of our cases aren't suitable for formal mediation, as it were, but we do very much try and avoid the need for going to court proceedings wherever possible. It's, in many cases, it's the absolute last thing that our clients want to do. They want to avoid court, and we actively try and seek an early resolution. We try and negotiate, we try and discuss, we try and settle cases, and it's, it's an achievement when we do that. Tom Brake. Could I ask a slightly different question? That is about your funders, and particularly, I guess, for Gillian, uh, Gillian Guy and, and Julie Bishop. Uh, and, uh, is there any uniformity of approach from, for instance, local authorities about the level of funding, or are you in fact finding some who are supporting the CABs locally and others who are cutting the budget completely? Yes. 
depends very much. Local, yes. Some local authorities yeah. are making a conscious decision to support their CABs or their law centres, yes. whereas others are making yeah. a contrary decision. It's, um, Julie Bishop. We, uh, earlier in the year, uh, surveyed every law centre to find out what was happening on this very question. Uh, we found one law centre that actually got a 12% increase. Uh, we found many that had had a 100% cut and we have all variety in between. Just to say for Citizens Should Advice Bureau that there is no uniformity. Um, some, some of the differences are explicable and probably desirable, but generally there is no uniformity around um, funding. Where authorities have taken a positive decision to keep supporting the advice service, it is very often because they have seen and registered and acknowledged the return on investment argument that there is for that, which is the very argument we're making on legal aid as well. That's very much been, Thank you. That's very much been our experience as well. We have a, a range of centres that have um, contracts with local, local authorities, either for advice work or for supporting people type contracts. <coughs> it's completely variable from area to area as to what's happening with those contracts. Thank you. Alex Cunningham, then Damien Hines. Now, Ms Bishop said that there are some 80,000 people attending law centres who won't be getting the service in the future. Uh, Ms Guy uh, spoke of the uh, tighter budgets to do what you're doing now and yet you face even more workload into the future. How will you cope with that? I mean, who are the losers? Or are we just facing a deficit? We're facing uh, well, a deficit of opportunities, uh, of appropriate support. Or are we facing much more of this rationing uh, that uh, Ms Bishop spoke about? My, Some of you. my worry is, um, on a number of fronts, is that if we um, lose substantial amounts of our legal aid income, then there are going to be a number of our clients um, who we're just not going to be able to help anymore. Um, we're not going to be able to sufficiently expand our charitable resources to, to fill that gap. But a further worry is that that is going to lead, not just within shelter, but across the entire advice sector, to a real loss of the skills base. There's going to be a lot of people who are uh, no longer going to be able to work in the advice sector, no longer going to be able to do this type of work, and therefore there are going to be the people to help in the future. So who are the losers? Uh, the clients the now, yeah. um, the advisors now, and the clients in the future who won't have advisors with the appropriate skills to help them when they need yeah, it. But what sort of, what, what's their uh, problems? What, is it the homeless, the families? The All of those. Um, it's it's, um, it's the homeless, it's people in receipt of benefits, it's uh, homeowners who are going through a difficult time, um, tenants who have difficulties with their landlords um, or with local authorities. Uh, anybody who is vulnerable and who currently needs legal advice may not get it in the future. Julian Guy. So the, the majority of the people who present themselves to Citizens Advice Bureau come for debt benefits, employment and housing advice. And it will be those people, as a result of these proposals, but also the other squeeze that's on, that begin to get even further rationing of, of that advice. And that's obviously not where we want to go as an organisation. Uh, I would say that we also have a responsibility to make sure we're as effective as possible. Um, and what we're doing is trying to make sure that um, we don't stick with maybe old methods that are cumbersome in terms of getting through giving advice to people. So we're looking at different ways of doing that, different operating models. Um, but I think it's also important to say that if there is to be an alternative provision for the social welfare advice, which we would urge uh, government to, to put together, and indeed there has been um, some indication of that with £20 million being set aside to, to look at that, that has to be sustainable. And, and it has to be something that goes on into the future so that we don't give people some hope and then take it away again. As ever, it's going to be the most vulnerable, those who don't know their way around systems, those who have multiple problems because one problem brings another, brings another, who are going to suffer the most as a result. Can I ask how you rush in these circumstances? How, who do you turn away? How, well, Julie Bishop. That, I mean, clearly that's the issue, isn't it? Who do we turn away, why and how? Um, and that is our problem every day. Um, about how do we ration and how do we do it. I think rather than nominating today who we're going to turn away, one thing that I will say is that one of our key focuses in the Law Centres Federation and amongst law centres are young people. And we are concerned that young people are being particularly disadvantaged by this bill. 
the people, and by young people I don't mean under 18s, I mean under 25s, and uh, we've submitted evidence as well on the impact of young people, and we believe that if you do not resolve a young person's civil legal issues such as housing, education, income support, etc., there is a direct correlation between that and criminality. And getting young people early, not only are you setting them up for life, but you're also diverting them from other bigger costs to government in the criminal system. So we have a particular concern about young people and how they will be dealt with. Secondly, I'd like to say in terms of rationing and what the end game is of this loss of funding is that what the government's losing here, it's not simply rationing, but they are also losing with the close of any of our agencies all the resources that we bring to it. And so for every pound we give to the government, this isn't a saving figure, but we estimate that we bring in about another £15 worth of additional resources. So that's the law company, the, the big law firms who support us, who house us, the pro bono, the charitable funds that government isn't able to access, etc. And that is to say nothing of our community links and the work we do with community agencies because it's at work with the non-advice sector that also gives you a full problem to the solution. What we're able to do is not simply solve the legal problem, but we can, through our other community links, address the compounding issues. When a law centre goes, you're not just losing skilled and skilled workers, but you will not recapture that resource that we bring to it. Damien Hines and Andy Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Um, I'd like to ask Gillian Guy, if I may, about your document towards a business case for legal aid, which contains some very, um, very impressive uh, cost-benefit ratio figures, which no doubt will be getting their fair airing on the, in the Chamber of the Commons. I mean, obviously, Citizens Advice does advice in a number of formats or through different channels other than legal aid as well. I wonder if you have equivalent cost-benefit calculations for those other formats. We do, have other we do have other calculations because uh, in, in times of justification for the kind of service that we provide, it's important to have the business case set out. And I'm very happy to provide the committee with, with any other statistics. I, I think that would be useful in a sort yeah. of simple tabular yeah. form. Um, I also wanted to talk to you about specifically the figures. Um, uh, because you've done this calculation which says for every one pound of legal aid expenditure, you, you, it says the state potentially saves X. Um, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You take things like savings to the NHS and net savings to the Exchequer. Um, and this may not be a reasonable question to ask you to answer verbally now, but perhaps you might do this in writing later. I think, from reading your numbers, that's not what you've done. It sounds like you've taken loss of employment as GDP loss, which would be many times, or several times at least, higher than the net loss of the Exchequer, which is the number that would normally be used in a cost-benefit analysis like that. And that, if, if, if I've read it correctly, and I'm not sure I have because I haven't got your source date, if I've read it correctly, I think that might quite radically change the £1 to £2.98 number, for example, on debt advice. So I just wonder if you might follow up on that with a written response. Thank you. Andy Slaughter. Right, Chris, this is Francis Coulson, if I may. I hope he's slightly neglected on the... Uh, on the end there. You don't get much legal aid in insolvency. Uh, well, I, I was going to say, yes, there'll be probably not a lot of legal aid in uh, insolvency practice, and you're mainly concerned with part two of the bill, and, and thank you for your helpful submission. I, I think we're, we're seeing some of the PI on both sides of the argument, uh, practitioners, uh, later on today, and that's where a lot of the focus has gone in relation to um, civil litigation costs. But... Do you see this as, a, as the effect on, on insolvency practitioners as an unintended consequence of the, the legislation? Uh, were you surprised by um, what you found in the bill? Um, yes, indeed. Francis Coulson. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, we certainly see it as an unintended consequence, and a lot of the consultation and the bill itself is um, framed towards personal injury. Mm. Um, we've heard a lot about cuts uh, in, in uh, legal aid budgets and, and the agencies today, and what we're looking at here is um, removing the ability of insolvency practitioners to recover funds for the state. If I could just explain a little bit, 
quite frequently an insolvency practitioner will go into a company or a bankruptcy where there is no money because uh, the directors or third parties have uh, either through mismanagement or uh, at the extreme end through um, organised crime conspired to make sure there's no money there. Um, <coughs> the only way that uh, any money can be recovered for creditors uh, is for the insolvency practitioners to make an investigation, which they're obliged to do, but then to, to bring litigation, uh, insolvency proceedings against those third parties for recoveries. Um, those can range, say, from mismanagement uh, at the low end. At the, the extreme end, they can range to cases that are uh, funding terrorism, and I've seen a number of those cases myself, a very serious uh, crime. Without um, the ability in, the, in those cases um, uh, to recover the success fee on, um, in litigation, um, the lawyers will have to work on, on risk. Um, and the, also the adverse cost premium, which obviously, as it's an after, after the event premium, are quite high, then those costs simply come off whatever's recovered, which is supposed to go back to creditors. In about 25% of uh, general insolvency cases, uh, the, the revenue is, is the unsecured creditor. Uh, I think that's probably significantly higher in cases where there has been fraud because the revenue is a target for, for fraud anyway, um, and tax fraud does fund uh, a serious crime. So there are, uh, it would really have three unintended uh, effects, I think. And first of all, it would make cases uneconomic for practitioners and their lawyers to take on at all. Um, and uh, therefore, there would be no recovery at all. Um, Secondly, I think there's, there's, uh, there will be a massive reduction in return to creditors. Um, creditors, obviously, not only uh, the taxpayer generally, but small businesses, employees, and other, other people. Uh, and thirdly, there's obviously a massive deterrent effect in preventing people, if you pursue people who've committed fraud and you take the, their ill-gotten gains from them, then they and others uh, that they know don't do it again. Um, there are other types of fraud that... Uh, Certainly, I've dealt with cases, for example, involving um, gang masters who cause, can cause untold misery, um, uh, you know, at the very basic level. Uh, and we've done one case where a, a, a non-EU national was running a company, uh, running uh, agricultural um, workers, minimum wage, deducting things like £1.50 for registering them with an H NHS dentist, taking the rest of the money off them for putting them in appalling, overcrowded uh, rooms and so forth. That company, uh, and they weren't paying the tax either, that company was provisionally liquidated by the revenue. <coughs> the insolvency practitioner that was appointed pursued the director, who had a house worth a quarter of a million pounds with no charge on it, took uh, all of that, um, all of his assets away from him. Eventually, uh, he was deported. But better than that, they sold the business uh, to a legitimate business, which then employed those people uh, with proper health and safety, proper minimum wage, and so forth. Mm. If you, if you can't take these cases on a uh, proper economic footing, all, the ability to do that will just be removed. Mm. Um, I, I, I think yeah, if you've got any further details, I know you've got one or two brief case examples in your submission uh, uh, of cases and how that works, because that seems to be taking us beyond simple uh, uh, recovery of hidden monies and into prevention of crime. So uh, I don't know if you want to say any more about uh, criminal activity, but the other question I was going to ask you uh, you mentioned the revenue. Uh, have you any I Again, you say in your submission that you think that the return to creditors will be down by almost half, about 47%. And I think you just said just now that the, uh, the revenue is a, is a creditor in about, is it about a quarter of cases or a quarter by, by volume. Are the revenue concerned themselves with this and are they making representations? And do you know what the overall loss to the Treasury is? Uh, I understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand the, the revenue are, have been speaking to the Ministry of Justice. We right. don't know the final outcome of those discussions, right. um, but certainly I understand they are very concerned about this. Um, it, for, if you take some of the areas that they've used the, these weapons in as one of the tools in their in their um, toolbox, if you like, um, carousel fraud, 2.6 billion loss to the country a year. Um, for how much? 2.6 billion is the, I think, the published figure for uh, loss in VAT fraud on, mm. on carousel. And that's that, that's where insolvency is used extensively, um, and just in general, uh, other insolvency cases. I think it would be very significant in the billions of losses in, uh, in terms of um, uh, removing a tool for tackling those things. 
do you see no, if, if, if the changes as, as, as envisioned in the bill, um, i.e., in relation to um, uh, the form of CFAs, but, but also uh, damages based agreements go ahead, do you see no prospect of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, dodgy directors, as you put them, being sued? Do you see that just collapsing as an area of law? I think it, oh, so it's uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it takes away at least half of those cases. Um, right. the, the, uh, insolvency was one of those uh, exemptions that the uh, original a Act in 95 it, it was introduced for that reason to enable mm -hmm. insolvency practitioners to bring these sorts of proceedings, um, and they didn't have the wherewithal to do that in sufficient numbers of cases um, before that. And I think we would be back to that situation. Um, and uh, and in fact, because the um, CFA work and, and uh, the numbers of people willing to take it on has developed. In fact, it would probably have a worse effect. We'd go backwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, they all go on to the legal aiders. Helen Goodman, Liz Cross, Kate Green. Uh, Mr. Pugh, I'm not sure whether you are the right person in Chelsea to be asking this, <laughs> um, but I want to ask you a question about homelessness and uh, ex-offenders <coughs> because we know that um, re-offending and homelessness are very highly correlated <coughs> and um, I was wondering whether you excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a cough <coughs> um, I was wondering whether you um, felt that at the moment there was insufficient coordination between probation trusts um, prison authorities and Housing organisations. <coughs> that's not something that I have a. That's not something that I have a detailed picture on, but I can certainly take that back, and we can write to the committee on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Liz Truss. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Tom Brake's questions uh, that he was asking earlier about the way the services are organised. Do you think that there could be improvements in terms of value for money when we have multiple centres? for example, from shelter, from uh, law centres, from Citizens Advice Bureau, perhaps in the same location? And do you also think that increased use of phone and email services could help save money but deliver uh, the end result to, to the consumer? Mm. Well, uh, I think, um, thank you. The reason why I've mentioned the Coventry example several times now is uh, because there is, there is a real uh, potential for doubling up on services, etc. But I raise it because I wanted to highlight the fact that the more common way we work is in collaboration with each other rather than doubling up. And the second thing to say is that the, we're currently not meeting demand as it stands. So would it be that we were doubling up but the fact of the matter is that, as we've discussed, we are rationing services already. And so although there appear to be a lot of agencies working in the sector, we're doing it because none of us, even together, are meeting the demand that's there. That's the first thing. The second question is about technological solutions, and that is telephone lines and uh, email advice, etc. Uh, law centres have long used telephone advice lines. Again, it, in certain situations it is very effective. Um, but what we've discovered in using it is that you need to have an experienced lawyer on the phone who's able to deal with the matter, understand what the problem is, be able to address whether a face-to-face -face appointment's required and bring them in. Uh, the way we do telephone advice lines is to front load the expertise rather than <coughs> have someone just read through a sheet. We do explore other various forms of technology, but I think what we talk about is the appropriate use of technology. Technology is a tool, it's not a solution. And the thing that we try to do is tailor our services to client needs. And so our client profile, I've already said that they earn less than £6 million pounds a year. Oh, £6 million, <laughs> my goodness me, £6,000 a year. Um, yes, I prefer to be one of those at the moment. But um, the other thing that I haven't said is that 
on average they have low educational attainment, they've often left school early, poor literacy and numeracy. So one of our biggest problems is actually people's ability to deal with the technology. So where we can, we do. Where people are able to help themselves, we encourage that. That's already our practice and that's one of the reasons why we get these good value for money figures. Right, yeah. Simon Pugh. Uh, we take very much the same approach at Shelter. We have um, an advice website which people can log on to receive advice and information. We have a, a telephone helpline and we provide um, legal advice over the telephone through contracts with the Legal Services Commission as well. So we have experience of delivery of legal advice and information through all the different channels. And they all work and they all um, deliver good advice uh, in some cases for some people but some cases it's not suitable for. There are, there are people who need face-to-face -face advice and it depends on the circumstances of the individual and it also depends on the circumstances of their case. So where it does work, yes, it can work very well and it can be very effective and it can save money, but it is not suitable for everybody or for every case. Julian Guy. I was just picking up the, the point around unmet demand and it is in, undoubtedly the case that there is enough work and more to go around all of our organisations and, uh, and currently there, there is quite a squeeze on the resource that we have for those. Uh, that said, I'm sure there is room for improvement and, and in any movement, if you like, that has grown from the ground up over a number of years, our own organisation over, over 70 years, there is room to look back at that and see how we operate. And also, even with our met demand, and this would be something we would have a responsibility to look at, we, we do sometimes trip over each other and there is a degree of duplication that we are mindful of and looking at. And actually, a squeeze on resources is the thing that tends to make you focus on, on doing that because we have a responsibility to keep services running. I said earlier that our citizens' advice uh, in the Bureau as well, we're looking at opening up different channels, actually providing advice for people in the way that they would like to receive advice. And I think that echoes the point that Simon Pugh has made, which is that there will always be a need, in our view, for some face-to-face, -face, but we ought to have the most effective and cost-effective yep. method for each person. That's also about a public accountability. We all receive some public money and we have to be accountable for it, and I think we, we uh, are transparent about that. But there is more room around being able to share together um, what we shared services, support services, premises, those kind of things. Yes. And that's absolutely what was underneath the proposal that we put forward to try and deal with this legal aid situation. Anne Lewis. Um, I'd just like to um, respond to the question regarding the use of technology. I know that the Ministry of Justice has suggested that um, telephone advice is cheaper, and that may well be the case. However, if you dig into the statistics, it does appear that um, the telephone advice um, system run currently by the Legal Services Commission does attract different people from um, those who are using face-to-face -face services and also possibly different cases. Um, it appears from, and this information has been given to the Ministry of Justice in our response to their original consultation, it does appear that um, telephone advice tends to be used um, more often by people who need information or they get information and it also appears that face-to-face -face advice certainly in housing that more people for example get rehoused or retain their homes if they've received face-to-face -face advice than those who receive telephone advice and my suggestion is that that's possibly because people are ringing um, about different issues the other issue relates to different people using the phone as opposed to face-to-face -face advice it does seem, and I think in our evidence, we pointed out that more non-white people use face-to-face -face advice in housing. It also appears that in relation to welfare benefits, um, for disabled people, um, for face-to-face -face advice, then 63% of the users are disabled, whereas that equivalent figure is 22% for telephone. So I'd like to emphasise that when comparing costs, it is important to remember that these may well be different people and different cases, so they're not directly comparable. Kate Green, Ben Wallace, Yvonne Favard. I just wanted to um, go back to the discussion we were having earlier about the uh, changes that are going on in welfare benefits, housing and so on, and the transition, managing that transition. Uh, and we've also got changes to child maintenance, which are, are I think, likely to create another substantial um, 
period of need for advice, and indeed I think the government acknowledges that in its own proposals. Can you give us any sense of the sort of time scale over which that transition is likely to create additional need? And are you already beginning to see any effects, uh, particularly, for example, in relation to the early changes in housing benefits that have begun to come in this year? We are starting to Thank see, you. We are starting to see um, additional queries about the housing benefit and people affected by those changes. But I think this is something that's going to be happening over the next two to three years as the various legislation passes through and comes into effect. I think one of the things that is a, a real concern for us is that with the combination of um, the, the welfare reform bill and particularly the changes to housing benefits and what's in the localism bill in terms of um, discharging homeless duties into the private rented sector and so on, there's going to be a lot more people with problems in the private rented sector who are going to need housing advice and are going to need housing help and that part of the safety net that is there for them the legal advice may well not be there in the future unless and until they get to the point of being immediately at risk of losing their home. But dealing with um, poor landlords, landlord harassment, um, problems of disrepair and so on, short of them being at serious risk of, of harm uh, to health, um, dealing with all those early problems we will no longer be able to do. So at a time when over the next few years there's likely to be more people pushed into the private rented sector with changes to benefits and housing benefit going on in the background. I think it's going to be the next two or three years where that's going to be a real problem. Universal credit is actually three. coming in right through its beginning in 2013, but it's going to be a long transition period. So yeah. two to three years, is that specifically in relation to the housing benefit changes? Yes. So and then there's would more anyone like to comment on the, the sort of how long you think we're going to be going through a period of heightened need in relation to other changes? So the, the trends we're seeing at the moment are that the volumes of um, requests to us are certainly increasing and continuing to increase, and we're trying to project that forward. The issues are changing somewhat, and, and debt and housing and employment is beneath that, but debt and housing are the main issues. Something that's quite alarming is the increase in inquiries from 16 to 25-year-olds around homelessness. Uh, threatened or potential homelessness or actually being made homeless and that, that's a particular concern to us and I think that the time frame is, is probably more like the, the sort of seven years, seven to ten when we're, when we're trying to look at our projections uh, because there are many changes coming together and one of the things we urge government to do across departments instead of doing individual departmental impact assessments is to look at the cumulative impact that this is going to have on individuals and families and then we can work with, with a, a whole assessment and be able to project what that demand is going to be. Ben Wallace. Question to R3, the CFAs and uh, the, the points you raised, and I was just looking uh, through your submission. Um, how many of the current sort of claimants that you represent or that come to insolvency practices need to use CFA as a way of funding their case, as, a, as opposed to people who may just be very large corporations or creditors seeking the money and perhaps can just pay normal fees? Francis Coulson. Uh, the insolvency practitioner brings the litigation as a representative effectively for all creditors and statute dictates how that money is then distributed once it's recovered. So if you take um, my earlier answer, a quarter of those creditors are the revenue, there will of course be some larger corporations in there, uh, utilities and British Telecom and so forth, um, but there will also be large numbers of smaller trade creditors, individuals and employees. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a body, those, those individual and, and trade creditors have already lost money uh, and asking them to dig into their pocket again, particularly a lot of this litigation can be quite complex, uh, last a long time. I, I, I still have a case that we've had in eight years. We've recovered money, we've recovered assets, but one of the properties is owned by a Delaware company and you know, a, a fake identity and so forth. So there can, it can be a huge investment of time uh, and energy to get money back for creditors. And other cases, um, we're about to send a cheque for £700,000 to the revenue on one case. Um, it, not a fraud, but just a, a sort of mismanagement of the company. So they're, they're large sums that can be recovered. You can't really expect individual creditors to, to fund these things. Uh, I, I think they're done on risk by the practitioner and their lawyers. Okay, um, it, I think the question is, I mean, in Lord Justice Jackson's report, I mean, he didn't seek an exemption no. for impact. He, he, he did when we talked about clinical negligence, he talked about concerns about 
uh, he expected legal aid for clinical negligence still to be carried on, but, but in your skill area, he didn't uh, try and carve out an exemption. Um, and, and I think th therein lies the following on question, which is the issue about the success fee um, and the principle of whether a defendant, because they're not all dodgy directors, I mean, there will be defendants or, or people that your creditors are seeking money from whose businesses just have not worked and gone bust for one, lots of other reasons. How many, I mean, is it right that a defendant pays a lawyer, not a claimant, not, not those creditors, a sort of win bonus, a success fee, to compensate the practitioner or the other, or, or the solicitor, for other cases they may have elsewhere? I mean, what, why is it right that that falls on the defendant to compensate for elsewhere, as opposed to someone else? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think we're necessarily talking about cross-subsidy cross of cases. If you take on a case uh, which you're wholly at risk for, and in an average litigation case, any lawyer will tell you there's 25% litigation risk just because of the nature of litigation. Um, the lawyer and the IP will have to pay their staff, they have to pay certain statutory fees, they have to keep going. Litigation can last a long time, and that's the risk that they're being paid for, the fact that they may not get paid at all on that case and that they, in any event, have to wait a long time for their money. And in insolvency cases, it isn't just winning the case, it's actually recovering money. So I take your point, uh, Mr. Wallace, about um, they, they, it may just be a business that's failed through no fault of, uh, of somebody's own. But in fact, the insolvency uh, litigation that we're talking about ranges from wrongful trading, which is trading at the expense of creditors when you should have known better, really, you know, to put it in plain terms, um, uh, right the way through to sort of fraudulent trading and, and, and that sort of end. So, um, you can take early advice if your business is in, in, in difficulties uh, and don't trade at the expense of other creditors because it, it knocks other businesses over. Uh, that's the problem. I, mean, I, I don't dispute the risk, I mean, mm. don't get me wrong, but, but also uh, you, you never know which practitioner has only you know, good cases and, and certainly in the other part of, uh, uh, of the law where you might see criminal, uh, personal injury claims, there are uh, uh, solicitors that only represent the easy claim and they don't go for the risky area and, and, and certainly no one can assess that at the time. So I don't, I don't dispute your risk, certainly in insolvency practice. It's the question of why that risk should be borne by a defendant uh, in a case that may not be connected with the risk that you carry elsewhere in your business. Well, it, thank you. Um, the, uh, the defendant will have uh, had an ample opportunity, obviously, to settle matters early on. We, we will almost invariably, in this sort of litigation, have, uh, unless it's a fraud where you have to freeze assets because you can't give them notice, there will have invariably have been investigations and interviews, there will have been uh, letters before action, there will have been possibly uh, a Part 36 offer to uh, offer them an opportunity to settle early. There will have been offers of mediation often. It is the defendant who fights uh, and, and loses, and it's their wrongdoing which causes, which causes the costs and the risk. Um, and then the creditors will end up paying for that. So in litigation, not just the success fee, um, which may be negotiated up or down, I mean, our, our practitioners do want to give a return to creditors, but they're taking a personal risk uh, as to adverse costs, um, and they're, they're not excused just because they're taking a representative action for creditors. And that's quite a high, that's a high premium. There's no reason why the defendant, who is the person who has committed the wrong, at, at whichever end of the scale it is, should make the creditors pay for that. We've got a minute left. Yvonne Favag. I think a yes or no answer is fine for this, though. <laughs> the government proposed that the only access to legal services will be via telephone gateway. Will this be appropriate for all the different client groups that you see? No. no. Julie Fisher? No? It, no, it's no. not. Anyone else with an answer? No, no, it will exclude people from seeking that advice. Julian Guy, yours is a... It's, no, and no. it will exclude people. Simon Pugh? No, and it will exclude people. Anne Lewis? I agree with the others. Thank you. Francis? That brings us to the end of that session. Could I thank our witnesses very much indeed for coming along, giving evidence today. It is very much appreciated. I'm sorry that we didn't get round to Mr Dave Watts and Mr Tom Brake with their second questions, but they can go first on the next session if they want to ask a question. And we're now going to hear evidence from Liberty, Justice and the Legal Action Group.